Quite a few volumes out there, I think. This is my twelfth, I think. Um, though I've, I've, I've actually signed. This is the first in what I'm describing to myself as the John Cat trilogy. So I signed <laughs> a three, three book deal with John Cat. I'm doing this. I'm halfway through a book about white working class underachievement, and I got about two thirds of the way through a book on metacognition, which I had metacognition for morons before I realized there was too big a moron to write it. <laughs> <laughs> and now, so we've got the first of a potential trilogy then perhaps. Yes. The, um, now look, it, could you hold it up there? Cause it's quite a striking image, I think. I can see it on looming over your left shoulder. And there it is. Can we see that? The fascist painting it's called. Now, tell me to, I, I'll go, we'll get to the subtitle in a bit. But the fascist painting. Now tell me, why is it called the fascist painting? Um, it was originally, and I, I think you might recall, it was originally going to be called the flight from vulgarity in uh, cultural capital and, and Bourdieu. What what he identifies is these kind of two polarities in terms of what's legitimate and what's illegitimate. And the illegitimate culturally is described as vulgar, and one might describe the legitimate, and that's in inverted commas. Uh, as refined. So it was originally going to be called that. But about halfway through the writing of the book, when, when we're looking at this idea of culture as man's search for perfection and, and improvement, I was just kind of fiddling around and I saw a brilliant cover image, which I wanted to use. And it wasn't this. Um, it was a, a kind of slightly impressionistic watercolour, which I, I quite liked. Um, and I was going to put that on the front cover. Because what you wouldn't have noticed had I had that on the front cover is uh, in the bottom right hand corner is, is a kind of scrawled signature and the signature is Adolf Hitler. So this notion of culture being man's search for per perfection or a man's path towards being near a God is kind of somewhat revealed to be um, nonsense by the fact that Adolf Hitler himself was a really quite competent watercolorist, you know, really not too bad a painter at all. And there was also, so, so the, the idea of the book is it brings out the political elements of culture and how culture is used to replicate social structures. But there was also a sense that I, I actually haven't written an education book for half a decade. The last one was how to teach literacy. Um, and things have progressed, uh, regressed in terms of what we regard as acceptable pedagogy over over to, over that time, and to me, you know, I detect a very authoritarian slant with which I'm profoundly uncomfortable. So I felt that the book could also not only be about culture, but could be a, a kind of freeze frame by which I, I record, you know, a now relatively ancient guy's views on the progression or regression of pedagogy over the last five years. And, and so the idea of the fascist painting, it's, it's a snapshot at where, uh, there's a snapshot of, of where I think we are in terms of a profession. Okay, so uh, I, I looked at it first seeing that cover and I think that, that would be good in, in an art gallery, you know, uh, uh, selling there in perhaps the Tate or somewhere like that, where I did notice one of your books before, by the way, in the, the Tate Gallery uh, bookshop once. Now, Caspar David Friedrich, are you saying that painting by him is, is a fascist painting? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, the, the only, in truth, the reason for the painting, and I sent, I sent the publishers a number of options which were you know, much more appropriate, which were kind of vorticist, uh, futurist paintings. Um, but it was one of the only German paintings that I was aware of. So I'm, I'm absolutely not saying that that is a fascist painting, though he did have a fan base amongst, amongst fascists. I think um, it, it's a thing of the time, isn't it? That everyone who is sort of German or Germanic culture, culturally was um, creating art and whatever. And by the time the German, the German Nazis came into power, they were all saying they like that stuff, but I don't know if they actually did or not, but that, that's that's another argument altogether. So your book is also focusing on cultural capital. And um, what's your book about? Um, 
it's basically a response to Ofsted saying that they're going to check up on the provision of cultural capital. Um, and it, it came about in a very odd way. I was booked to do a speech about it in, in March uh, for the Hackney Learning Trust. And I'd spent about 14 days on the speech, which is, uh, as you'll know, quite a long time to, to spend on a speech. And, and, and it became immediately apparent that what Ofsted had defined cultural capital is, but with reference to the national curriculum, was actually the opposite of what cultural capital is in terms of you know, the, the Bourdieuian idea of it. And that what they were doing with it was stripping it out of its meaning and its context so that it could become a metaphor that could mean anything that anybody likes. And so it was clearly a, a, an interesting path to go down. Um, I, I had at the time, you know, I, was, I was teaching a couple of days a week at a school in Basildon and that, and that kind of fell through. And so I just felt it might be a very interesting path to go down. Um, and in doing so, you know, I, you know, you know, of course, one would, if one examines cultural capital, one, one would come across Pierre Bourdieu, one would think. <laughs> and and I, I read quite a lot of Bourdieu. I was very, very lucky in that I chanced upon this brilliant young man called uh, Luke Shoveler, who led me in the direction of, of places that I should read, um, other authors that I should read. And, and so basically, what is the book about? It's a left wing analysis of the provision of culture in schools, um, I think. And it's a, a left wing analysis of how, you know, that uses Pierre Bourdieu as a lens through which we can see how culture itself is used in the social space to replicate uh, class structures. OK, that's very clear. Interestingly, the first quote in your book is from a well-known right-wing thinker, I think, um, Roger Scruton. Yes. Um, so it's not just taken from a limited uh, range of um, sources. You're obviously looking around and reading around. Is this Luke Shoveler's influence on you, taking you to places you wouldn't ordinarily go? Or is this something of your interest to look at culture in the widest sense and then bring it into a more... Uh, left-wing field perhaps right well I, I have no idea who Luke Shabler is and I probably mispronounced his name um, I do find Roger Scruton fascinating um, but I, the, that quotation there is deliberately juxtaposed with a quotation from H.G. Uh, Wells' The Time Machine because I, I, I think the intriguing thing is that H.G. Um, Wells' The Time Machine went forward and what Roger Scruton seems to have wanted to do and i do yeah you know, i find him intellectually a fascinating figure was to go in the time machine and go backwards and it's it's pointing out two polarities of, of a view of culture that you know roger scruton describes culture uh, a high culture and he doesn't put inverted commas up on it as the means through which educated people communicate with each other and recognize each other and I just found that fascinating that he would use the word educated because the implication there is that if you do not have access to high culture or legitimate culture, then you are therefore not educated and therefore you're not a voice worthy of listening to. And I juxtaposed it with the, the time machine quote about the Morlock on the Eloy, which kind of tends to suggest that this going back to the past of tradition, what is that likely to cause in future? it's likely to cause more extreme social stratification. Okay, so if we take that on board, high culture being what, what Scruton is talking about, an educated person would raise up towards a higher culture, a higher way of talking, a higher way of thinking, all these sorts of things. What do you mean by culture? Well, you, you know the Raymond Williams quote that is one of the two or three most difficult words in the language. Um, in a relatively simple way, um, I tend to view it in the in the process of writing the book, and I'm aware from Luke that this is sociologically the opposite of how sociologists view things. That we talk about it, I talk about it on a micro level and a macro level. So basically, culture is everything. Okay, it's, it's every practice, but within schools it's the arts. So on a micro level, the, the kind of transmission of culture is the transmission of the arts and what version of the arts we transmit to young people. On a macro level, 
it's basically every, every every social practice that we do. So our food is a culture, uh, the way that we dress is is a culture, the way that we hold ourselves, uh, the, whether we are polite or whether we swear, that's cultural. So yeah, I, I remember having an argument with a lecturer who destroyed me when I was young, and he said that everything is political. And I, and, yeah, and I couldn't accept that at the time. But yes, he was right. Everything is political and culture is by nature massively political. Okay, but before we go any further on on that side of it, the political side, can we just clear up this one thing here? Are you just talking about the arts in schools? Is that the main focus of the book? Is the arts, or uh, is science a culture? Is science are the sciences part of this or not? I do, I, I do kind of glance on that by I, I, I put a list of cultural forms, and of course that and that does include science, and it includes psychology. Um, yes, science is culture. Um, but, but the focus of the book is, is on arts provision. So the conclusions of the book are related to what view of culture at the end should we be inculcating in young people and what, how might we alter or adapt the arts curriculum so that one, we can actually fulfill what Ofsted want but we can fulfill it in a way that it's not a symbolically violent act where, whereby we're just taking the culture off the kids and replacing it with a, a, an allegedly superior culture, which is actually the, the possession of uh, the, um, the tradition of a ruling class. Okay, so, uh, and again, to clear up the thing about the arts, you're an English teacher. Yes. Does English language teaching, English literature teaching, become part of this is history the humanities part of this right you, Martin, I'll, I'll kind of have to stick to areas of expertise really um yes of course how we teach history is profoundly politically important but there are experts in that and idea yeah, that that's not me in terms of the provision of what we provide for children as as what is appropriate literature for them to be reading in schools yes i would have that within the arts curriculum okay so as, a, as an English teacher, without and I would question the idea of being symbolically violent myself, but I, I understand the, the well, thing underneath it, which you're saying there, which is saying, this is your culture, it's all wrong, here's the proper culture, have this, and that can be quite a, a, a violent act. I think that's, that's the way you're using it there. Well, um, I, I think to deny, I, I think what's happening in, in education at the moment, is that what we're, we're, we're replacing certain, certain students' culture with this idea, which I'm very anti, which is the idea of being disadvantaged. So we're not saying that um, the white working class kid has a culture that's of any value. We're saying him, he is disadvantaged and the advantages are to be found um, according to the current establishment. The advantages are to be found, and I'm not disputing this, that there are advantages to be found. In the... <sighs> In the inculcation of the handing over of a different tradition, a tradition different to the to the tradition that the child's culture is used to, um, and and it is by nature, by implying that somebody's own culture is valueless and giving them access to a culture that you imply has more value, it is by nature a symbolically violent act. Yeah. So, if does a child have a quality, qualitatively good education outside of school? I mean, is there much purpose in going to school, in other words? I mean, what, what is the role of school to introduce them to? If it's not their culture, then it's whose culture? Right, well, it, it, I think we, we glance here upon my, my, Michael Young's idea of powerful knowledge. Um, now, Michael Young has been used by establishment forces to argue for this kind of the knowledge-led school. Um, and actually, powerful knowledge is, is probably a bit more sophisticated and complex but, than that. I absolutely agree with Michael Young that there are things that you that you get at, you have to get at school that you can only get at school that you won't get at home. However, the assertion, or the kind of covert assertion that a certain strata of culture um, is, is superior to other strands of culture is for me, in this kind of Arnoldian sense of culture that we're inculcating at the moment, is for me a, 
a deliberate act to replace one thing with another. And there are forms of working class culture that are valuable. And the intention of actually in, uh, introducing a, a legitimate culture to kids is, I believe, and I had an epiphany about this two, two weekends ago, to destroy popular culture. And by popular culture, I don't mean sugary pop hits. By popular culture, I mean trade unionism. I mean affiliations to organizations that seek to improve equality of opportunity and outcomes. So this, the, the, the assertion of this kind of canonical culture is a distraction technique to distract people away from things that will improve their lives. Okay. The, right. I, I, well, I want to see two different directions here because you've, you've got the institutions of, of the working class, the trades union movement, the old um, WEA, the Workers Education Association, the things like that, and, and sort of a tawny idea, you know, bathing in the it's in, in knowledge as, as a great thing. I, I, Robert Tressel, all those all those people sort of talking about education of the working class and the importance of that. And then we've also got popular culture and perhaps uh, as part of the opium of the masses coming into it as well. Yeah, we also, there's, another, there's another view of that though, Martin. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah there, are, there are all kinds of opiums of the masses. And whilst yeah, one, might, one might have the sugary pop hit as an opium of the masses, one, one would also say that one can become incredibly literate through the study of, of decent lyricists. Yeah, my, my path towards literacy was dominated more by Leonard Cohen than it was by, by, by any novelist. And, and yeah, to say that, that, that for me, the, the idea of popular culture is, and why an establishment, a Tory establishment at the moment wants to introduce yeah, a white canonical culture, is that popular culture is the one thing that they cannot control. Now, what do you get a social class that have already got everything? You get them more. And how do you get them more? You get them more by crushing dissent. And, Currently, we have a situation where there are organizations expressing dissent about their conditions and the, as uh, Varoufakis puts it, as the depraved inequalities in our society. And, and, and how is culture, be, yeah, and it's, it's a question rather than a statement, how is culture being used to crush that dissent? And the, the view of the book is that it is actively, though, though covertly, used to crush dissent. And that actually teachers need to see where these ideas come from and what's what's actually the the, the, the kind of what's what's the founding idea behind them. And so yeah, clearly it's a yeah, it's a kind of rebellious left wing text, but I think there's a lot to rebel against at the moment. I think uh, all all for rebellion. Uh, go go back to the Scruton thing at the beginning. I mean, he, he actually had some echoes with people on the left, like Adorno, um, Williams, uh, uh, people like that, talking about popular culture in such a way that there's the commercialized popular culture, and then there's the culture that comes folk culture, if you like, that actually is, is born up from the roots, from the from the masses, from from the people themselves. And perhaps there's a level of commercialization that they all balk at, including Scruton, he has a man on the right balking at this, saying that that form of culture is, you know, not good for the working class. There, there, you know, there is good stuff out there, but how can we tell, Phil, how can we tell what's good and what's bad? How do we teach that this is good, good popular culture? This isn't so good popular culture. I, I don't really have an answer to that. You know, how do we tell what's good or what's bad? I, I think, well, perhaps we need a, a, a diverse range of people ask their opinion on that, as opposed to a Tory establishment who, yeah, the moment that Gove got in, not only were many of the ladders that the Labour Party erected kicked immediately over, but I, and this is every bit as dark as it appears that we moved away from, and you, you remember this, the, the poems from other cultures and traditions on, in the AQA anthology, which for me was, it, it educated me because I came into the profession with some pretty ignorant views about um, black culture, you know, really gen, genuinely stupid views. 
And it was only the process of, you know, of a degree level educated man teaching poems from other cultures and traditions that caused me to have the, the intellectual respect for those traditions that I do have now. Now, pretty well immediately they got in. They shifted that off the curriculum. And pretty well immediately they got in. You know, we, we had American novelists shifted off the curriculum. And all of these things examine inequality. And then, then it becomes a compulsory assertion of a, of, of a particular strata of culture. Now, I'm not saying in any way that kids shouldn't read Shakespeare or Dickens, and absolutely not that they shouldn't read Blake. Yeah, Shakespeare had profound insights into the human condition. Shakespeare examines what happens if you become power mad. Shakespeare is a morality tale for the establishment. Dickens was politically of the left and you know, Blake was a revolutionary. All of these things are fantastic pieces of literature and I still love teaching them now and kids still get a great thing about it. But what I'm arguing, arguing for is a little bit more diversity in the selection. In that if we have a canon that is asserted or, a, or the appropriate culture for school, which is asserted by a, a right wing white public school educated establishment, you'll get exactly what you've got now. Okay. Whereas if you had some kind of sex selection process for culture that acknowledged that not all of us come from that right wing private school establishment, then then we might get a, a more diverse offer in which children can actually recognize their own faces and their own voices and their own stories. Is Shakespeare, you, you, you bring him up there, is, is Shakespeare part of a universal culture or is it part of the public school culture? Is it something that should be taught to all or is doesn't we don't see our faces in it? Well, th there are black faces in Shakespeare. Um, what do you mean by universal culture, a culture that belongs to everyone? Yeah, I'm just wondering here about working class culture, public school culture, making that that dichotomy perhaps yeah, well, they, they are distinct there is a history and a tradition of teaching shakespeare in state schools so clearly it's part of uh, it's not part of a formally exclusive public school culture whereas matthew arnold for instance is you know in, as influential as he has been around our view of, of of a whole culture matthew arnold has been historically the the possession of the elite shakespeare is not and yeah certainly hasn't in the last 50 to 100 years been a sole possession of the elite so it's not a means through which the ruling class has previously attempted to distinguish themselves from the animalistic working class okay so so shakespeare gets in um what what other things well, Martin, i'm saying i'd be happy to be on the panel but i'm a white middle-aged male and i'm <laughs> arguing for my i'm arguing for my own assassination actually <laughs> <laughs> Well, what I mean, Paul Morley is arguing in a, in a, in a recent book that to to turning his back to some extent in his elderly 50s and 60s to, to look back on his youth where he looked at punk and he wrote for the enemy and all that sort of thing. And he's actually saying that classical music offers far more radical music than anyone else. Um, oh, is he gone? Did he get upset there? <laughs> to get back in. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Start back at Paul Morley. 
yeah, for Morley. So he's talking about classical music. So blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, hang on. I think it's, it was, there we go. That's me adjusting rather than the autofocus. So, Yeah. <laughs> Drive the ladies this wild. Is, this is the proper rumble, Martin. <laughs> yeah. So Paul Morley arguing that classical music is actually very radical and, and some of the most radical music ever made and um, wondering why it took him so long to get round to it. Should we be opening kids' eyes to the stuff of the tradition, if you like, of the canon, but also making sure that the canon is as varied and as wide as a worldview on what the canon might be rather than a narrow nationalistic English view, perhaps? Yeah, the, I, I would tend to always agree with that. But what I would first say about Paul Morley is that he was always the least interesting and least able of of the rock journalists on the NME and Melody Maker. I never found he ever really had anything interesting to say. Um, but in terms of look, I, I, what I'm not arguing, Martin, is that you do not give kids access to canonical culture, um, and and I think it's entirely reasonable for schools to try and give kids an education in classical music because yeah classical music is the is the kind of more or less complete possession of the elite um and yeah our, and as a result yeah, most working class people and i count myself in that uh, have absolutely no understanding of what's good and what's bad. Yeah, I'll pretend that I like Bartok just because I like the sound of his name. And I'll, I'll occasionally quote the one composer that I do like, Pendereski, but I'll, whenever I'm with classical musicians, which happens sometimes, I'll, I'll tend to use the word Pendereski just because I can show that I know one composer's work. So yeah, the, the book has been thought through and it's been thought through that Broadly, as much as I kind of despise some of the you know, establishment patriarchalism, um, broadly, it, it concludes that actually, yes, kids do need access to, uh, to the higher culture. Because, as Bourdieu says, that when you've only got the ruling class that has access to this higher culture, then, then they tend to use its absence as a, as a means of denoting animalism in, in others. And so consequently, if we don't want to be seen as animals, then we don't want our children to be seen as animals by, by the class that rules over them, then we would do very well to equip them with this ruling class culture. However, when we do so, we have to explain its political context. We have to explain its history. We have to explain how it is used to oppress. And one of the beautiful things about equipping kids with this version of culture, and I do it myself, I, I teach locally on a Saturday, I have a Saturday job at the moment. I teach uh, at a local school and I teach Aristotelian rhetoric. And the kids are blown away. And I'm not saying I'm in any way experts at expert in Aristotelian rhetoric but it has historically been the exclusive possession of, of the private schools and and actually Aristotelian rhetoric is pretty damn simple so structurally it's 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 mainly just putting things twos within threes and once the kids start to see if you put twos within threes you can write to to a to a similar level to rhetoricians that are in parliament it's mind-blowing but the 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 really mind-blowing thing about it is how easy it is. So I, I do actually approve of, of importing ruling class culture into, into working class schools, but, but its history must be explained and its, and its political use to oppress must be explained. And we do that in order so that the kids can get inside of that ruling class culture, see how it works, and in some cases, call it out for the sorry sham that it is. Because it's only through knowledge of something you can tell whether, whether it's any good or not. But I'm also saying that ruling class culture itself cannot be the sole culture in schools. 
and that we have to have a look at working class art forms. And the, and the, the theory at the end is that there has to be a degree of conformity if you want to pass off said, okay? And, and yes, you know, let's have a look at this ruling class culture, but let's use it as a spring for, springboard to make working class art. And yeah, there are certain predominantly working class art forms. For me, poetry is now predominantly a working class art form. Hip hop is a working class art form. Um, there are certain working class art forms that that we can use as, as a lens or as a vehicle with which to analyse the the cultural traditions that have been enforced upon us. Okay, so in the long term, in the long term, what what what's your end game with this? When you saying hats off to you for the Aristotelian rhetoric, of course, um, teaching this stuff, saying it's at the moment it's part of a ruling class culture, perhaps in 20, 30, 40 years time, should it be part of the the popular culture, the, the, the culture of the masses? Should it be part of the, you know, every every person should have it in their locker, so to speak. So the culture is declassed or do you want to keep culture as class ridden? Well, yeah, OK, so you're arguing that I'm arguing against the democratisation of high culture. I'm not exactly. arguing. I'm asking the question. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't really. Can you repeat the question, Martin? Sorry. OK, it's, it's just if we say that working class culture has, you know, this is what it looks like now. This is what high culture looks like now. So Aristotelian rhetoric is part of high culture in 30, 40 years time. Will should Aristotelian rhetoric still be part of high culture or should it be part of everyone's culture? In other words, are we democratizing high culture and making it available to everyone so it is no longer part of high culture? Right. I think yeah, the, the serious intent would be yes, to democratize high culture. Um, that, that's a really poor answer, I'm sorry. I had, I had a better answer prepared, <laughs> I've forgotten it. Um, I, I think the serious thing, yes, is, is Definitely, we democratise high culture. No, I can't fucking think what I was going to say. Nils, edit me out. Keep <laughs> <laughs> <He's> swearing in. <laughs> Can I just have a think of what I was going to say then? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I had it bang on. Um, no, I, I can't remember, Martin. Have a, have a, have another go at it. Just. No, just... I did. Uh, it's just that that idea that I had has now eluded me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But give me the give me the cue board of the question again. Well, basically, it's just asking. You know, is is high culture to remain high culture and, and working class culture to remain working class culture, or is it there some way of leveling? Right, I've got it. Ask the question again. Oh no! <laughs> now the test is for me. Now <laughs> we'll we'll keep the question as was. You answer it now before you lose it. Go. On. Right, I, I, I think that the the provision of high culture into working class homes is, you know, with, with all the political elements that that has, actually long term, yeah, you know, the adaption of so adoption or an adapt, the adoption of rhetoric in in kind of working class kids gives them a tool that they can use to challenge the structures that oppress them. But I think you can teach these things either in a symbolically violent or a symbolically non-violent way. So, for instance, I give an example of, of two examples of rhetoric in the book of um, anadiplosis, which is my favourite rhetorical technique, where you take the last word in a clause and use it to start the next clause. And that works really nice in a tricolour. Now, a four year old can understand this. And then I look at Polly Sinderton, which you'll know, <laughs> Polly Sinderton sounds like a really kind of big rhetorical thing, but it's basically just using a load of ands. And I point out the kind of people that use Polly Sinderton. So Boris Johnson uses the money ands approach in speech writing quite a lot. God equally uses polysynthetic coordination a great deal. But we also point out that not only the senior politicians and, and divine majesties use it, but four-year-olds use it as well. 
So what you can do is you can you can put a political slant on things or a political undercurrent, which doesn't have to, which you know, certainly isn't explicit, where you can draw the correlations between um, how ruling class culture has been used historically, how actually it's a lot easier than we think it is. Like my son's just learned music theory in, in six months um, and how we can use it as tools when they use it against us. So it's, if somebody, when you go to uni and you're from a council estate, starts laughing at you because you don't know about Bartok, um, it, it's, it's perhaps only through equipment, uh, through equipping this kid with, with ruling class culture, plus, plus the tools to defend themselves against symbolically violent acts, that, that they can actually realise that the reason this person's lording it over me is because they're an idiot. That's a, a full answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, if to come to an end, what's been a, a fascinating um, insight into your book and your writing, and and the book itself gives a fascinating insight into you as well, which is which is quite interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, right. And, and you're like, you know, things like you, you, you're talking about David Bowie in there. You obviously South London boy, you know, and and all that. There's 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 connections all over the place. But but also working class people, um, who are educated, self educated a lot of the time as well, you know, and 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 still hungry to find out things and and to you know, it's 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 a book that loves knowledge, if if anything. Um, in terms of where you would like to see schools go at the at, at in the culture wars i mean i'm using this term advisedly obviously but it's it's a short I, I remember we had a tiny little tweet exchange and i asked you a genuine question that i didn't understand i didn't know which was what was a culture war and that you might have taken that as disingenuous and it, mm -hmm. and it was this was before I, I wrote the book and you, you came up with a really really clever reply which was it's a war that nobody wins right and that's not true, Martin, I don't think. I think the culture war, the, the thing is to look at the culture wars. Uh, the thing is to look at the culture wars through a certain lens. In that, who started it? Yeah, who started class war? And I would argue that, well, I don't even need to answer that question because it's so bloody obvious. And what we have at the moment is we have representatives of an aristocracy, a representatives of an establishment, such as Douglas Murray and, and the, the comedian that you had on a couple of weeks ago. And yeah, it, it, which is to me evidence of why you don't have right wing comedians, because there's nothing funny whatsoever in punching down. Okay? And so the cult, the culture war, I, I think, has to be engaged with because the right wing have never, ever put down their tools. They've allowed the left wing to be shushed. And I think this is happening pedagogically as well. Okay? We have a, a kind of all right influenced right wing. Of, of British education at the moment, who are currently you know, very, very much in the ascendant. And the other side has put down their tools. And the, the intention of the book is it's, I want it to be, if this is not overstating its importance, a rallying point around which maybe the left wing can actually start believing in themselves again. Because I, my, my view of what we've gained out of cognitive um, science it's, it's perhaps not as good as what we've lost. Okay. And is I, I, I could talk about whether cognitive science is left wing or right wing or or, or a view from nowhere, which is something you say in your book there about there being no view from nowhere. Um, is the culture war, and again, it's shorthand, but is it class based then? Is it about class politics? Or is it about identity and identity politics? And are the two the same or different? I don't, your, your comedian dude that you had on a couple of weeks ago, I, you know, I, what I would say about him was he articulated his position extremely well. But he said a number of things which you didn't call him on. Now, this has been quite a you know, enjoyable conversation between kind of two intellectual peers. But you let him get away with a hell of a lot. That, that I don't think that it's appropriate for people to get away with. Um, like the, he, his statement that, uh, that the white fragility book was the worst thing that he'd ever read. Um, 
he caused me to buy it so it resulted in one sale and it whilst it's whilst it's not um yeah whilst it is a little bit like being whacked around the head by a haringey council social worker i think there are times when we need to be whacked around the head by a haringey council social worker um and and it, it just intrigued me that this person arguing for the establishment view would would write off whole fields and then he did something which again you didn't call him on um, he did something where by he started referencing, and this is an alt right uh, alt right strategy at the moment. He started referencing those French philosophers and postmodernism, and he was seemed to be, and I've no doubt he's read Foucault. He seemed to be moving in the direction of kind of mentioning Bourdieu, but his his example to show the intellectual deficiencies of postmodernism and French scholars was Kate Millet, and again you didn't call him on it. You know, Kate, you know, the 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 idea that, for instance, Pierre Pierre Bourdieu and Kate Millet have a great deal in common is is nonsense. And 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 my view of these people is that they argue exclusively with straw men. If you have a look at Douglas Murray talking to James Dellingpole, the most loathsome journalist in history, he's in his he's in he's like a, a duck in water there. And and he describes Extinction Rebellion as weirdos. Okay, that we shouldn't listen to them because they're weirdos. And and the, the alt-right cultural commentators, again, they argue against the cultural commentary of, of the left-wing scholar. And yet, what are they doing at the same time? They're, they're you know, making cultural comment. So in response to your question about identity politics, it is identity politics which is the only thing that causes political change. It was identity politics which caused the suffragette movement. It was identity politics that caused the end of segregation or the end of official segregation in the States. So I think what we're doing, again, we're just, we're, yeah, it, it's kind of vile, really. Um, and, and particularly with what, what happened this week about the, the notion that you can't use teaching materials from groups that identify as victims. Yeah, you know, what is this? This is a brute, this is Orwellian. This is a brute force right wing, okay, saying that you cannot bring in Black Lives Matter into, into school without without coming up with kind of a balancing statement from the opposing view. Now, the opposing view of Black Lives Matter is Black Lives Don't Matter. And so what I'm attempting to do with the, this book is, is really just, just put a, a kind of flagpole in the ground and say enough's enough. Okay? There is an opposing side to this, this story. And the opposing side is not the size of, of despite you know, my colour and my, uh, my age, it is not the argument of a white male establishment. And that is the only the only argument at the moment that we're seeing on media channels. Phil, it's been an absolute pleasure listening to your, your wonderful, wide ranging thoughts on, on such a fascinating topic as culture in schools, cultural capital, and what we should teach our kids. Um, tomorrow and in the future. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Please read the book if you if you um, like a damn good read. Um, it's well worth it and it will certainly stir you or, or to either bring you to the barricades or, or make you want to fight back one or the other, but certainly it makes you think. Thank you very much, Phil. I hope you uh, have enjoyed it too. Thank you. Yes, I have. <laughs> You may think you're